so uh, this is the hot topic of today is uh, liver transplant in the covid era uh, yeah so this is the outline first uh, very briefly about the virus then how to manage previously transplanted patients especially their immunosuppression second is how to perform transplants during this time so about the virus we know most of this so incubation period is about 5 days most patients present to the hospital at about 7 days from the onset of symptoms highly transmissible highly contagious most commonly asymptomatic the biggest problem most common problem for symptomatic patients is pneumonia while mild uh, pneumonia is uh, you know recovers on its own in about 10 days time but severe is where we face trouble high risk population is well known to most of us now elderly diabetics like comorbidities such as diabetes hypertension heart disease uh, pulmonary disease and such there is some evidence in literature of liver injury also being uh, seen in uh, severe covid specially as part of the multi system involvement uh, what we have also come to realize is the infection is not avoidable all we can do is restrict its spread and postpone the peak the pandemic we realize may take a few years to die down Uh, not months which we thought initially until a vaccine becomes available or good antivirals are available or an herd immunity may develop which is actually happening in some parts of uh, the world and uh, there is a recent report uh, that in mumbai there are about 60% uh, people in a certain area which have become um, immune so with the experience what we have learned is that uh, for asymptomatic or mild patients home or institutional quarantine works well and for some sim severe symptoms uh, hospital and icu are required and although there are no medicines that have been proven to help but uh, close monitoring and whatever we have available is uh, what we do uh, how do we uh, manage previously transplanted patients so this is uh, the series uh, case, you know all the publications which are single case reports from all over the world different parts mostly uh, from Uh, uh us and from italy these are the places from which maximum amount of publications have happened and uh, just a glance at it uh, it's quite similar to what a covid patient non transplant covid patient is uh, so uh, not a very high mortality only one patient uh, one mortality in this uh, series not series like a series of publications uh there is uh, you know symptoms are characteristic the same fever hypoxia cough so everything is similar now uh, what we notice is that there is a significant amount of patients who will demonstrate liver injury and not all of these patients will have rejection so a lot of uh, patients will have liver injury but they will on biopsy will not be found to have rejection so about half of them will have uh, rejection which can be triggered by a viral infection anyway but some of them will have a liver injury which is not rejection which is uh, uh, as seen on biopsy what people have done is uh, either they have stopped immunosuppression or withdrawn mmf only or uh, withdrawn tacrolimus also so basically at this point uh, when all this was happening this is all publications from the last two months nobody really knew wh what should be done so everybody was uh, doing the most logical thing now these is case uh, reports also show that there are some perioperative infections which have also done well although they did get uh, pneumonia but there are two cases i would like to uh, highlight one is this uh, fourth publication by lagana which is uh, a pediatric uh, transplant where the donor was found to be positive and the donor recovered the patient uh, never got uh, the infection and the last uh, case report which is by hong this is again a living donor transplant where the donor uh, was uh, found to be positive after the transplant and this case i'm going to discuss it in a little more detail so the patient the donor did not uh, have symptoms initially uh, and uh, the uh, once the donor developed symptoms they sent the test but then the test uh, report came back after uh, two days when it was already post uh, donation so on day 1 of the donation uh, of the uh, donation the uh, report came back positive so they did give uh, lopinavir and ritonavir to the donor but for the patient this ud is undetected so the for the patient they tested multiple times and the patient never came back positive although they did give antivirals which we know don't work and the hydroxychloroquine that again we know doesn't work 
So this was an interesting case. What they concluded, there are a couple of things, and this was an ABO incompatible transplant. So the patient had already received rituximab and plasmapheresis before this. So they could not really change anything at this that point. So what they uh, in the uh, literature review of this paper, there are a few interesting things that they have said. One is that the virus doesn't have very significant presence in blood or plasma, and they have checked this on the histopath of the liver also. So uh, the uh, 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 only about 15% of pe people who will develop corona uh, covid infection will have viremia the others the disease is very restricted to the lungs so they have in their discussion and uh, they have quoted another paper here where they have said that non lung organs actually could be donated and could be used for transplantation a controversial point but this is one of the interesting things from this paper one of the uh, cases from uh, uh, delhi where a patient uh, who was quite sick apparently the, the child was quite sick and underwent a transplant uh, after the donor was positive and then 3 weeks later after the donor became negative they went ahead and did the transplant the standard recommendation may be a little higher but this was also successful uneventful absolutely now this is the unfortunately the literature uh, of case series is so sketchy because some of these case series are just few sentences in another article so anyway so this is uh, a, a series of uh, three kids who under who had covid positivity in uh, from italy out of about uh, 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 many transplants they did state the number and this is the first one d antica but the one second one is from 640 transplants they found that about 1.25% that is eight patients were, were positive most commonly males and uh, more uh, about 3 months uh, to 4 months after transplant 75% of them were on cni and mmf standard immunosuppression 50% of them have had comorbidities the symptoms are quite similar to our routine covid patients but there were no mortality so all of them recovered now this is an uh, interesting another paper this is where uh, this is also from italy what they noticed was Uh, that patients who were long term after liver transplant more than 10 years had which who and also had uh, much uh, lesser immunosuppression did much worse than compared to patients who had uh, who were short term after liver transplant uh, within 2 years so they divided all the transplant patients uh, less than 2 years to 2 10 years and more than 10 years and this was their finding with that they concluded that patients who have um, a higher immunosuppression which is full immunosuppression that is about 10% in the long term patients and 70% in the short term patients they tended to do better because their hypothesis was that the, they were able to avoid the cytokine storm uh, having said that you know these uh, groups are also quite different because uh, the, the long term patients also have more comorbidities and therefore it may not be a very accurate conclusion from uh, this because all three mortalities were in the long term patients and none of the mortalities were in the short term patients having said that because the comorbidities are higher in the long term uh, patients we don't know uh, whether this conclusion is going to be valid so we looked at some more papers so this is the series from new york 38 patients uh, had uh, infection out of all the transplants that uh, had happened in that uh, before that like in the past Uh, so these are patients who have uh, previous transplant who have come in with a covid infection out of this only 21% of these patients had transplant within the one year last one year we are not talking about mortality only incidence of covid so the incidence of covid is not doesn't depend on really whether you are uh, early or late after transplant the interesting finding here is that there is 42% patients also had gi symptoms which is quite out of proportion to and 57% had aki which is quite out of proportion to what you see in covid patients non transplant uh, covid patient like a standard covid patient so this was a little intriguing so uh, of course uh, we looked at some more papers but uh, in uh, most of their papers uh, patients uh, they reduced immunosuppression and had some rejections which were easily uh, 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 reversed seven of these patients they lost seven patients which is about 18% mortality which is uh, again a little higher compared to a standard covid patient now this is a, a survey paper from 57 patients across 19 centers uh, european centers 70% male again so very similar to the new york paper 6 years after transplant was the standard uh, uh, median 6 years after transplant 55% of their patients had comorbidities so except for the duration after transplant the rest of it is similar 
Here again, the uh, percentage of patients who have GI symptoms is 33%. Quite higher compared to standard non-transplant COVID patients. They found lymphopenia was a poor outcome uh, variable. And patients with cancer, uh, HCC or PTLD, in, which was in five out of the seven <coughs> mortalities they had, was higher. Now, this probably is, uh, again, I would take this with a pinch of salt because, uh, you know, these are all six years out uh, patients. And while PT, PTLD, I would agree that they are uh, higher at higher risk, but HCC six years after transplant, not uh, really able to understand well. So they didn't make uh, very significant changes <coughs> to immunosuppression. Their case fatality rate was 12%. Now, uh, two more uh, papers I'll discuss quickly. So, uh, this is another series by Webb, a very short paper. This is all across the world. So, centers from all across the world, 39 patients reported COVID. They had about 23% mortality. They did not find any difference in uh, age, obesity, other comorbidities, time for transplant be between patients who had mortality and the others. And the immunosuppression was also similar. Uh, another patient, uh, another database from Europe, from ELTR registry, 103 patients with uh, uh, COVID and after liver transplant, 74% male. Again, diarrhea is about 24%. Rest of the symptoms are similar, but diarrhea is 24%, little higher. Uh, case fatality rate is about 16%. So, we are coming to a general idea that uh, the case fatality in COVID in liver transplant, probably around 15%. Uh, diarrhea may be a little higher than uh, standard COVID patients. Duration may be important uh, in uh, knowing whether uh, in you know severity or mortality, but we don't know that for sure. Now this is an interesting uh, paper. So this is 272 cases from 88 centers. This included 57 uh, patients who were candidates and 272 patients who were post liver transplant. So the blue is the candidates. Red is your post transplant, sorry, green is the candidates, red is the liver transplant patients, and blue is general population. So, <clears throat> they also reviewed the differences in the uh, policies. So, just to get that out of the way, the uh, only 86% test the donor before uh, accepting them for transplant, 14% don't. Only 69% people re uh, mandatory recipient testing, and uh, others uh, do it selectively. So, uh, if there is a patient, person who does not have symptoms and has low epidemiological risk, they would not test the donor or the recipient in a lot of European centers. Not, not a lot, but some European centers. Now, here is an interesting thing. So, the candidates have much more incidence compared to recipients or general population in all countries. So, this is 1% for the candidates compared to about 0.3% for the uh, general population or recipients. So, their conclusion was that the chances of acquiring COVID was much higher in a chronic liver disease patient on the waiting list compared to a post-transplant patient. And even the mortality was higher amongst candidates compared to a post-transplant patient, which is about 15% like we discussed. And for candidates, it was about 18%. They did not, they, they found that recipients were more often symptomatic. They more often required ICU and had higher mortality compared to general population. Now, this is an interesting paper, very recent, where they analyzed 111 patients from uh, Spain, again, COVID and uh, liver transplant. So, the incidence was higher compared to general population about twice. The mortality was higher uh, compared to standard. Uh, so, uh, mortality was not higher compared to standard population. So, uh, the, their standardized mortality ratio was 95.5, so just about the same as a standard population. But when they looked at the patients who were on mycophenolate, they had a relative risk of about 3.94, so almost four times uh, higher risk of get, uh, getting a severe COVID infection. Now, if you split it by uh, presence or absence of mycophenolate or dose, uh, a dose of more than 1,000 made much more difference compared to having or not having a my a mycophenolate. So this was interesting. So even if we're giving mycophenolate, it should be at a low dose is what they concluded. <coughs> in this Post-transplant care, we know this. It's generally no different from a standard person in the general population. You know, you wear mask, social distance, hand wash, isolate, whatever. And with, if you take all these precautions, even if everybody around you has uh, COVID, uh, uh, there should be very minimum chances of you acquiring them. And 
uh, as uh, we discussed, these are the standard uh, COVID protocol uh, management protocols followed in most hospitals. Although we know that a uh, lot of the controversial data exists about each of these, and you know, uh, if we have to uh, state it in short, I would say that most of them don't really have enough proof that they work. Now. Um, some of the things that we've uh, realized with this is that liver injury is pretty common. So uh, different papers state that it is between 14 to 53 percent and it may correlate with the disease severity of the COVID. Diarrhea is one of the common presentations. As far as uh, uh, immunosuppression is concerned, there are some papers that say that higher viral load may uh, be one of the manifestations or even prolonged shedding or prolonged transmission because of COVID, uh, because of immunosuppression. But it may protect against the cytokine storm. Uh, most people say that you should reduce MMF and uh, especially if the white count is or platelet count is low or there's area which is uh, also common with COVID. If uh, you're going to reduce the TAC, the main uh, reason to do that is if you're suspecting or uh, encountering uh, secondary bacterial or fungal infection. As far as steroids is concerned, because it is one of the drugs indicated for COVID also, uh, most people uh, recommend that you give steroids, at least stress dose steroids. And people who have developed ground glass opacities or pneumonia, you could consider stopping mTOR inhibitors because they can also cause interstitial pneumonia. So, uh, and the controversy about whether they get patients get more severe infection longer after transplant is, uh, in my opinion, still unanswered. The other thing that we have to worry about is drug to drug interactions. So, all the arrows that are pointing up show that they increase the levels of each other and all the arrows that are horizontal show that they don't increase each other levels and uh, the downward. So the red boxes are where you have to be careful and try to avoid giving those two drugs. If you're giving the yellow uh, uh, boxes, then uh, please uh, check levels of your immunosuppressive drug often. And the green boxes are where you uh, try to uh, give it at a lower dose. Uh, performing liver transplants in the COVID era. So it is primarily going to be governed by the rules that are uh, existing in each country and each uh, society. In most countries have given out uh, guidelines for this because it's very difficult to get evidence uh, which is reliable uh, with such a short period of time. And we have to also recognize that in different parts of the uh, country and dif different parts of the world, the con resource constraints, especially for ICU beds, ventilators, PP kits, critical medicines and blood products could be very different. So one guideline or one way to manage this situation cannot be applied to all others. Uh, especially because this is a long surgery, the risk to healthcare workers is also higher and uh, there is also risk to the patients and other patients and their family members. So in addition to the standard risk of liver disease and liver failure and the risk of transplant and the, uh, we also have to now factor in the risk of acquiring COVID and uh, the risk of uh, the standard risk. Now this is a paper which was uh, written by Srinivas Reddy uh, where uh, six centers from all across the world participated, uh, two from India, uh, two from UK, two from the US basically to show that did the COVID did make a huge impact on the amount of transplants we were doing. And in India, in both centers, it was the reduction in the uh, transplants was more than 90%. <coughs> in the UK, the transplants reduced by about 80%. In the US, it reduced by about 60 to 80%. Now, this also showed to us that the num reduction in the liver transplant activity was quite disproportionate to the amount of number of cases. Because when this survey was done, at that time, the number of cases in the US was hardly anything. And therefore, uh, at, at that time, the reduction was uh, much lesser. But then subsequently, and at that time, even in India, the number of cases were very little. But the reduction of cases of transplants in India was much more than elsewhere in the world. This is the time when UK was at its peak. You know, UK was the epicenter of uh, COVID uh, when this was uh, uh, data was collected. And this similar uh, findings have been reported by others also. So uh, people who have done transplants during COVID they have uh, not really faced much of a problem, but uh, in this uh, study where they've said that uh, uh, they, their uh, uh, volume reduced by about 50%, they just lost one patient who was also a, a concomitant HIV positive patient. Now, that's why we have guidelines and so every country in the world, including ours, have uh, guidelines. This is a nice paper where they have summarized all the guidelines from all over the world. And they've divided the guidelines into four. Uh, 
uh, immunosuppressed transplant patients so somebody who has been transplanted in the past and which countries support these recommendations for example whether they should uh, postpone the visits whether uh, they should be provided with the immunosuppressive medicines and stuff like that and then the second is uh, general management of transplant program i'll be happy to share this uh, paper if you would like and then donor how to manage the donor whether to test the donor whether to uh, accept a donor organ from a donor who is covid positive and then the recipient so this is this was the most interesting read and they have given a score for every uh, society that uh, 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 supports the particular recommendation a positive score for a society that opposes a particular recommendation a negative score and then they have sort of try to give it, get a consensus based on the guidelines all over the world one of the interesting uh, algorithms in uh, one of these guideline papers was uh, this one and this uh, actually is quite uh, good so basically first check uh, your recipient uh, by, uh, on phone uh, if there are symptoms or epidemiological risk then uh, get a pcr done proceed with transplant if they are obviously epidemiologically positive don't bother testing uh, give it to the next patient as far as the donor is concerned uh, if they already have a pcr test and it is positive of course uh, they can't donate for 28 days if it's negative then you could go ahead with the transplant if the patient donor has epidemiological or clinical risk then they divide they are divided into high risk intermediate and low risk and depending on availability of test then you decide whether or not to accept this so this is a very uh, very logical and good algorithm to follow something <coughs> similar is being followed in zpcc mumbai and i'll come to that very shortly so what they have said is you should have a phased approach to liver transplant so depending on the pandemic phase in your city or your country you decide how much of uh, reduction you want and depending on the percentage of reduction of activity you want you decide or prioritize patients who whose risk of acquiring covid during that time and of the team taking the risk is uh, justifiable and depending on that you choose a certain uh, type of patients alone so this is again a very good uh, uh, way to look at the whole thing noto the uh, national organ transplant uh, organization and ltsi have also given the guidelines i am sure all of us will be familiar with this so they have acknowledged that transplant is risky during this time because of the risk of acquiring a nosocomial infection and it should be done at dedicated centers if there is a positive case in the hospital you should se select the transplant team member <coughs> selectively transplant centers should send advisory to their patient maintain a database of patients who have positivity assess uh, local ep epidemiologically and make a decision accordingly and they should establish a covid free transplant pathway which most people are doing uh they said uh, that we should do a epidemiological mm -hmm. screening if positive then do a pcr patients may not manifest symptoms which is also something that we see use arogya setu app symptomatic patients should be treated either at home or uh, hospital depending on their severity immunosuppression management is uh, on the discretion of the transplant team recipients family members should uh, follow transplant uh, government advisory for travel uh, they have also said that uh, acute liver failure patients go ahead with transplant for aclf or hcc patients a center should use the recommendation <coughs> non elective trans transplant non urgent transplant should be uh, po uh, postponed for two weeks but this was in uh, april first week of april so we've already crossed that and they have given uh, certain guidelines for both cadaver as well as uh, living donor transplants this is the interesting uh, table from the uh, noto guidelines where they have said that in future when the uh, antibody test becomes available then this is what we should do and now that the antibody test is available this is a good uh, protocol to follow so if the igg is positive then you should be able to go ahead with transplant and uh, if uh, pcr is positive of course then defer it and they have also put a checklist for exactly the same thing that we have discussed so these are the two checklists so you can just take yes or no and uh, sort of make a decision whether you are allowed to do the transplant or in zccc mumbai what we have also done is uh, some more additions to this and uh, we have said that in super urgent cases like these like acute liver failure pnf hat uh, vatkiari uh, wilson's disease and all we should go ahead in urgent cases which is defined as estimated six month mortality more than 60% more than 50% which is again defined by aclf hyponatremia which is unrelenting hrs refractory ascites grade 3 4 he Meld more than 25, CTP more than 12, HCC within UCSM, hepatoblastoma. 
these should be prioritized after the ALFs. And then there are elective patients who uh, will be in a position to wait for a few months before uh, they need it. Recipients should be available locally, even if they are from out of state. And again, this is uh, similar to our DOTO guidelines, but COVID-free pathway compliance undertaking by the hospital that we are complying to all these, consent, uh, healthcare worker screening, uh, clinical screening, and if positive, then they don't participate in transplants for two weeks. For disease donor, a negative PCR and CT chest is mandatory in Mumbai. And uh, for uh, uh, this is how uh, uh, it is in the uh, ZTCC and DHS Mumbai protocol, where there is epidemiological screening A, clinical screening B, imaging C, and PCR D. If all four are negative, it's a low risk donor, you can go ahead with transplant. If epidemiological or clinical are positive, but C or D, imaging as well as uh, uh, PCR is negative, then it's an intermediate risk donor, but you can go ahead. If it's C or D are positive, then it's a high risk donor, then you can't go ahead. This is our experience of all four global hospitals, which Dr. Dharmesh was also part of. So 31 liver, living donor transplant, the liver transplants we've done over this period when since COVID, most patients were sick. So high melt scores, high melt patients. All donors have recovered well. Sepsis related to both related to mortality in two patients out of 31 and non-COVID related mortalities. They had standard ICU and hospital stay. Really, uh, the experience was no different from when we used to do transplant for non-COVID patients. So in summary, uh, all these guidelines have been uh, framed and uh, issued generally in April. And few societies have actually revised their guidelines. So in June and now in August, we have very different scenarios. So it's, there is need to revise most of these guidelines. If no COVID in a liver transplant patient, there is absolutely no need to change immunosuppression. But if it is there, MMF may be reduced to risk, reduce the risk of severe infection. Immunosuppression withdrawal is not advisable because it may also be harmful. Uh, for transplants to be done, a plan based on the phase of COVID pandemic locally should be made. The incidence is higher in liver transplant patients. They are more often symptomatic, more often require ICU, may have higher mortality compared to general population, but it is certainly less than patients who are on the waiting list. So that has to be balanced. Consider the risk of liver disease and COVID because unfortunately the high risk patients for COVID and the patients who are a typical standard liver transplant patient are exactly the same. About 70% of patients who undergo liver transplant are male. Most of them are now around 50 to 60. A lot of them are obese. So the high risk patients for COVID are exactly the patient, a standard liver transplant recipient for to, of our times. So therefore it will be very tough to avoid having a high risk patient uh, who uh, are not under a transplant in this era. So we should though try to reduce the pre and post operative stay and try to avoid uh, using extended criteria graft so that their uh, recovery is faster and they don't uh, remain stuck in the hospital for a long time. Thank you very much.